they had no real answers. And, and I had to just come up for one to help save my life. I signed up for a jail sentence. And I, and I didn't mind doing the time that was left on my sentence. But I didn't sign up for a death sentence. And, and my fear just overran me. And I had to do something that, I, that was very displeasing to me and my family. I had to leave that place. And, and I ran into words of fence. Uh, which has razor wire. I threw my stuff over the razor wire fence and I climbed over the fence, got my stuff. Hi my friends, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today we have a crazy story about an inmate that escaped a federal prison because he was afraid of catching coronavirus and a death sentence. He actually went on FaceTime and did a whole interview from an undisclosed area. So I have clips of the interview and I want to give you my opinion on if I agree with what he did, if I disagree with what he did, as somebody who is involved with somebody who's incarcerated. So if you're interested, please keep watching. <music> If you're new here, my name is Ro. I am the founder of an organization called Strong Prison Lives and Families, the author of a book called The Comeback Code. We don't glorify or glamorize prison or prison wife life here, but I will teach you how to make the best out of this really painful, hopefully one shot deal. Do me a favor and hit the thumbs up button on this video. It helps me out so much in YouTube. Also subscribe and ring the bell so you're notified every single time I post a new video every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and sometimes we go live on the days in between. Okay, this is a crazy story that I heard about yesterday. My details are as of Friday at 5 p.m. It is Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. So things might have changed. Actually, I have my computer sitting literally right here. You can't see it. So we can check out the details together and see if anything has changed. But Richard Cephas is a 54 year old man who was serving time at federal correction camp, or they were calling it a camp, but I think this whole complex Butner is called a camp. It's in South Carolina. I'm telling you that for a reason. That's gonna be very, very relevant later in the story. But he was there for drugs. And so I believe he might've been at the medium, but he might've also been at the camp, which is the lowest level of security. So we'll get there in a second. He said as things started escalating with the coronavirus and there was stuff coming out in the news and the newspapers, there was a town hall meeting inside of his facility. And they were asking one of the unit managers what was going on, what the plans were. There was barely any soap. There wasn't any hand sanitizer. And he said that they were kind of getting beat around the bush type of answers, that he felt like her answers were disingenuous and he was concerned about his own health and safety, especially because inside you cannot social distance. We're all very well aware of this. I don't think she liked the inmates asking her questions, but we wanted to know how we could we be safe because we didn't have enough soap. We're seeing articles on TV on social distancing. And these are some of the things that you know, we had no control over social distancing and the antibacterial soap that they, you know, should have been issuing to these units. And so that, that became a problem for all of us. And so there was a few guys who would speak up and, and try to figure out, you know, the best plan of action and try to keep us all safe. As time went on, he was getting more worried. He said his wife was sending him emails about how many cases were at each institution and he was growing more concerned because he's getting older. He also has an underlying pre-existing health condition. Eventually one of his friends told him that somebody inside of that facility tested positive for the virus. That was not confirmed for him, but basically his friend was like, listen, don't go on the phones after this guy. Don't go on the computers after this guy. Stay away from this guy specifically because he tested positive and you don't wanna get there. I was terrified. I mean, literally just terrified. So he said boy. that he believed he had no other choice than to figure out a way to keep himself safe and healthy and away from this virus that was doubling by the day. I don't know if he meant in there. I don't know if he meant out here, but we all know how quickly this has been progressing. So he was scared. He figured that he had to take matters into his own hands. And so it was at that point that my anxiety got the best of me to where I had no choice but to figure out an alternative plan. And I, I told my wife, I'm out of options. These numbers are doubling over. We're not getting any masks. We're not getting any soap. The staff is able to come in and intermingle with us and touch stuff. And he said so he wasn't given a death sentence. He 
had no problem doing the time that was left on his sentence, which he said he didn't really know because of the first step act and the time people are getting back was somewhere between 18 and 24 months. So instead of waiting those two years, he figured if he stayed in there while coronavirus was spreading, then he was given a death sentence, especially because he has an underlying health condition, which makes his white blood cells really low, which in turn makes his immune system really low. And he's very susceptible to pneumonia. He talks about a time a couple of years ago where he was hospitalized for pneumonia. I do. It's called neutropenia. It is the gateway to pre-leukemia, according to Dr. Kotry, one of my uh, doctors that handled me in reference to my illness. He drafted a letter earlier uh, stating to the BOP that the conditions there are not conducive due to my medical condition that they were putting me at risk. This was one of the fears of my doctors that put me in a situation where these people don't, I mean, they try as best they can, but sometimes it's just not as clean as it is in your home environment. The reporter went on to, I'm sorry, this was funny to me, but the reporter went on to ask him how he actually escaped. And he skirted around that question. He kept talking about staff and blaming them for not being able to social distance them. And he was talking about how dirty it was in there. There was no sanitizer. This went on for a couple of minutes. Then the reporter changed his wording and he asked him the same question. Mr. Cephas tried to skirt the question again and then finally he gave in and he answered. In my opinion, I think he was buying some time. I think he was trying to figure out a story because I don't necessarily believe him. What he said was, his job inside is a unit orderly, meaning he is hired to clean the units. So part of this job is taking out the trash. He put all of his personal belongings in the trash can that he was supposed to be taking outside to take out the trash. So he takes out the trash, he goes up to the fence, and he said that he was throwing his personal belongings over the fence that does have razor wire around the top of it, and then proceeded to climb the fence and run through the woods. And then he laid in a ditch until the coast was clear because this was at around 9 p.m. I'm not certain, but I believe someone who came into the parking lot around that time when I was laying in a ditch, I uh, think some headlights had swung around and I, I'm almost certain that the guy acknowledge someone on the radio and say, hey, I think somebody just went over the fence. And so I went deeper into the woods and maybe five to seven minutes went past and I started seeing a lot of trucks, a lot of activity. Uh, in the distance, I could hear a helicopter coming. At some point, I heard that helicopter with somebody with a tailgate drop and saying, come on, boys, we're going to get them. And so I figured they had dogs and that helicopter. So I, I jumped into a small creek uh, to, to try to get away from these dogs and, and the helicopter and stuff. And, and I just continued to run for my life. I just, I ran from 9.35 till 4 o'clock in the morning until I reached dorm. Okay, so let's stop there for a second before we continue his story. So let's look on the BOP website together because I want to confirm where he is. Find him in. It's a good thing because I could put in his name, his race, his age, and his sex because they're all in the article. Okay, unfortunately they have him on here as escaped, but you could also see that he's in a medium. So his story is a little more believable to me now. Here's why I doubted his story. Razor wire, first of all. Second of all, according to Adam, now I, I don't claim to know everything and I don't claim that every place is the same. Where Adam is those fences are censored. And I believe that there's an electric shock that runs through them, similar to a dog's collar, a shock collar, where when there's too much motion against the fences, then it gives off an electrical shock. A lot of times, if it gets way too windy, they will recall everybody inside and lock down the institution because it sets off the motion sensors on the fences and then they can't differentiate if someone's trying to climb the fence or if it's just the wind, so they have to get everybody inside. So the fact that this guy says he climbed the fence made me question the authenticity of his story and the fact that he was beating around the bush, he didn't really wanna dry snitch on his own self, 
how he escaped, but maybe he had help and he didn't want to snitch on that person. I have no idea. Maybe it's different at Butner. Maybe they don't have motion sensors on the fences. Although if they do at McKean, which is much older than Butner, I believe Butner is a newer facility in South Carolina, then I don't necessarily believe his story, but I don't blame him for not telling the truth if that's the case. Let's continue. So he winds up getting through the woods. He winds up at this old restaurant, sitting there having coffee from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. with a homeless woman. He asks this homeless woman if he could borrow her cell phone. So he borrows her cell phone and he calls his family and he tells them what's up. And then a couple of distant family members, supposedly, wire him some money and the homeless lady is able to retrieve it for him. And then in turn, as a thank you, he gives her $20. And do I believe that story? No, I'm sure his family's helping him, but he doesn't want to incriminate them for harboring a fugitive. <laughs> he goes on to say that he was very humbled because he had to eat out of a trash can, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And then he made his way to an undisclosed location where he did this <laughs> FaceTime interview with this news reporter. So where he got the phone or I believe it's a phone. I believe it's a phone the way it was set up, but where he got the phone or the iPad or the computer or whatnot, whatever he used, whatever device he used to do this interview, it's not said. I don't know how much money he was wired by family, but there are definite huge holes in this story. So when the reporter asked him, well, what are his plans? What does he want to do? He wants to self-surrender again when things are calmed down. So here I am. Mm -hmm. You know, waiting to self-surrender and have some help from the media and, and other people. Mm -hmm. He said he's reached out to a few attorneys. He named by name, I will not, very famous attorneys in the criminal justice space. And he's waiting to hear back from them because he wants to self-surrender after the media helps him, after these attorneys help him. And he's, uh, in so many words, basically protected from the government. So I sent him an email and I haven't gotten a response back, but I wanted these guys to try to work collectively to help me come up with a solution so I can self-surrender so my family is not stressed that I can get COVID out here because I'm not around anybody. I'm not getting my medication that, that is needed. And so I'm pretty much just waiting on a response back from these guys that I reached out to. Do you think that these attorneys are going to put their whole lives and their careers at risk? for a fugitive, for helping a fugitive. Of course they didn't respond to him. Anybody who knowingly and willingly assists in harboring a fugitive or helping a fugitive is in violation of federal law themselves. Ugh, what are you doing, bro? Come on. I feel like I would know Adam's response. Like it would be something along the lines of, I wish I could do it in his voice, but what are you doing, man? Like that, you know how they say man with like a G at the end, man? I don't know, I, I can't do it, but what are you doing? I get told all the time, people think that I'm pro-criminal. I will always defend the inmate, always have their backs because of my position. Absolutely not. If 2.2 million people are incarcerated in the United States, are 2.2 million people supposed to have the excuse that they need to get out of there because of COVID, because it could be a death sentence and we should just allow 2.2 million people to climb the fence? And these are the feds you're dealing with. Do you think they care about your pre-existing position, your lungs, your pneumonia, or COVID inside? No, they don't care about anything. And now it's game on for them and they're coming for you and they're coming for you hard. So do you think that you're just gonna go back and be like, okay, everything's over now. I'm ready to serve the rest of my 18 to 24 months. Let me back in. It's all fine and dandy now that this is over. Hell no, they're coming for you. They're coming for you hard and you're gonna easily get, easily get five years added onto your sentence and go to a pen, a high security facility. I don't know what you were thinking, but this is just stupid. And this whole entire thing, you're making excuses for why it was okay for you to escape and you're just, you're just waiting it out patiently. Do you think that after doing FaceTime, the feds did not subpoena that reporter his cell phone records, ping towers, look for IP addresses, and I have a message for his wife, who you could tell has been helping him all along. What are you thinking? You obviously were involved in this plan, sending him the numbers, telling him to, to get out, 
don't you think we're all in a point where we are so fearful for our loved ones' lives? Girl, you just extended your stay in this not fun, not elite club, and I will gladly exchange my lifelong membership to this club with you because now you have about seven years left on yours and I still have, I don't know, 200, I mean 190 or something like that. I can't even keep up. Let me quickly tell you a story in comparison from Adam. This was a conversation that we had years ago at Visit. And this was him saying that he's not institutionalized. This is his claims. In that aspect, it makes no sense to me, but it's how he, I guess, tries to tell himself that he's not institutionalized. I don't know. And I mentioned this once in the video where I talked about how he was able to leave prison for the day and then come back and how institutionalized he, I think he finally started to realize that he was. And he said, if a plane came, touched down, landed, was ready to take him overseas, could not get shot anything on the way out, he would sit there next to the plane and say, I am not going, I'm not going, I'm not risking it. I've put in too much time. I'm way too close. Just like every time they take him out for medical, he says, and this is what I talked about in that video. He says, I will not risk it if this van crashes we're in the woods i'm not running you're gonna have to send another van to come get me because i'm not putting my family through that i'm not putting myself through that i'm not putting you guys through that it is not worth it to me to get that do it the right way buddy you had a year and a half to two years left i don't know what he was thinking i do not think this was a good plan of action i know for a fact those attorneys are not getting involved in this let me know what you guys think in the comments below if you agree with me, if you think he had a right to leave and do this. And I apologize if his wife is a member of SPWF. I hope I'm not offending you, but girl, we need to talk, so contact me. Don't contact me. I'm not going to respond. <laughs> Forget I said that. I'm not getting involved. Let me know what you think. If you haven't already, give us a thumbs up. You guys keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to all being behind you. Lots of love from my heart to all of yours. I will see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one. Bye guys. Because I remember the moment that I had to make a decision that would affect my life forever. To do something like this that I had never done before.